Welcome to Linux Matters, a podcast featuring three experienced open source professionals as we discuss the impact Linux has on our daily lives. This is episode 38, and I'm Mark. This week, I've been trying out Android apps. Hello, I'm Martin, and I've found all the best top-like GPU tools so you won't have to. And I'm Alan, and I've written a thing, and I didn't use Bash. Last time we spoke, I was discussing an Android app I was using called Tempo, which is a subsonic client for streaming music from a self-hosted subsonic server to my phone. And one of the questions Alan asks was, does it work with Android Auto? And at the time I said, no, it doesn't, because I believed that to be the case. (laughs) (laughs) Did you get feedback? Not yet. Maybe by the time this goes out. But what I did do was search the issue tracker and find a comment saying, Android Auto feature should probably be mentioned in the readme, so it's better known. It turns out it is supposed to support Android Auto. Nice. But Android Auto can be a bit finicky. Because I'd installed the Tempo app from the F-Droid app store, which is like a, an open source app store, rather than Google Play, you have to enable in Android Auto, allow unknown sources for such an app to appear. Uh. Oh, I did not know this. No. So I did this, and Tempo did in fact appear. However, what it didn't do was work. Oh. <laughs> I did find another bug saying, if you launch the F-Droid version, it just displays a blank screen in Android Auto. What you have to do is manually download the APK from GitHub and install it. And I thought at that point, hmm, maybe there's a better option here. Maybe I should see if there are other subsonic apps which support Android Auto and do it a bit better. Is there some... Well, obviously there's some reason, but... Is the reason that the build that's published in F-Droid is missing a component because for some reason they can't ship it or something? I don't think it's intentional, no, from what I can tell. Oh, it's just broken. Yeah. It's just a bug. Yeah. Okay. So I thought I'd do a quick roundup of the other apps I tried and what I settled on. This was based on searching for Android subsonic apps that support Android Auto was the criteria I was going for. And then I have some more personal criteria, which I'll get into as to what I actually ended up with. So the first one I found was called GoSonic. And this appears to work. I got it working in Android Auto, no problem. I got it connecting to my server and seeing my music, no problem. The downside of GoSonic is it has quite a dated UI. All of the other apps I found had nice modern material design android uis this looked a bit more like what you, what you might have found gingerbread like 1.4 or something. <laughs> yeah gingerbread kind of era of android that's not necessarily a problem if it worked fine however go sonic is it's not open source and what i've found is quite common these days with android apps is that rather than being a few quid in the play store they're free to download in the play store but then have some sort of limited trial mode which you then unlock with an in-app purchase in this case what GoSonic have chosen to do is make it so you can only have three songs in your play queue at once oh wow unless you pay for the full-blown version and that basically isn't enough for me to evaluate my use case which is driving around with my family we've got a couple of playlists one of my daughter's songs one of our songs (laughs) And we switch between them on request, essentially. Well, there's three people in the car. Yeah. Like one song each. One's Poo Bear. <laughs> like, you know, you're fine. Yeah. So um, I didn't pursue out, uh, Go Sonic any further. I then found Ultrasonic, which is open source and works. The downside of this one was that the Android Auto UI is quite basic and it was a bit cumbersome for the the switching between of playlists it doesn't remember if you've told it to shuffle. If you then switch back to a playlist which you were previously playing on shuffle, it then doesn't do that unless you tell it to shuffle again. And it also doesn't support voice commands for loading a playlist. You can't say play car music and it plays car music, which was an issue I found with my previous non-subsonic audio player. This is not sounding very good. (laughs) But wait. Oh, good. (laughs) I then found another app called Symphonium. And this is kind of a Swiss army knife of the streaming client world. So this will connect to all sorts of services and servers for streaming music. And it'll also do stuff locally. And it has a million settings. It kind of made me think of a KDE app when I was looking at the configuration option. There might be too much configuration there, but it's very flexible. And it does work well on the phone and 
in Android Auto. It's very featureful in Android Auto. It supports saying play the name of the playlist. You have an option whether you want it to remember the shuffle status or not. And it is, again, uh, it's a proprietary app in the Play Store, which does this sort of trial unlock with an in-app purchase. But the trial is time limited and fully featured, which has meant that I have been able to test it out on some long car journeys and make sure it does everything. So I'm quite happy in that regard to chuck the you know five quid or whatever it is to unlock it. Is Symphonium also available in F-Droid and to separately download as well as in the Play Store? As far as I'm aware, it's proprietary and only available through the Play Store. Okay. Although I haven't looked into that too much, but I don't think it's open source. In this case, I mean, the app I was using before, which was Musicalette, wasn't open source either, but it was sort of the best one for my needs at the time, which is why I went with it. So I am i don't feel um, too bummed out about paying for a quality app in this case. So does that mean you have paid for this quality I, app? I haven't you, yet oh. because because the free trial hasn't run out. Uh, of course, yes. <laughs> I'm not going to do that too soon, are you? I think I've got about another week just in case something sneaks up on me and uh, and changes my mind. But no, quite happy with it. Very, very much planning to pay for it um, unless I find yeah, another option suddenly springs out of the woodwork before I get there. And if I remember correctly, you weren't actually using Subsonic as the server. You're using a Subsonic protocol implementation, an app that is compatible with yes. how Subsonic works. So that does speak to sort of the quality of the server implementation, because I imagine these clients are probably only being tested against Subsonic proper. Good question. I mean, in the case of Symphonium, the entry is brackets open subsonic so i guess it has right. been tested against more than one implementation i'm not okay. certain and yeah not sure about the others really they just say give it your subsonic compatible server url here and yeah i guess they do some testing interestingly actually looking at the i can't remember which which one it was it might have been tempo they were talking about testing in android auto and it sounds like one of the challenges there is not every open source app developer has a car that supports android auto so they're working on the support via an emulator oh right that there is an android auto emulator yes. and they're uh, they're programming against that implementation okay yeah so if people are saying oh well it doesn't work with my car they're like well sorry i don't have mm. i don't have a mercedes <laughs> to test it on <laughs> So is this the end of your subsonic journey? You have all your needs met, all your desires are fulfilled? Almost. So the one thing that I would like, which I don't think Navidrome, which is the server I'm using, does, is I'd quite like it if I could create a user account for my daughter, which can see a selected subset of the entire catalogue. Because there is some stuff on my server which is not appropriate for a four-year-old which is not Pooh bear yes right. exactly <laughs> yes there's stuff which is you know her albums which is you know fine i could just give her her access to her albums but i'd like to let her explore the stuff that's fine for her to listen to among our wider collection but at the moment it doesn't look like navidrome can do that i might have to explore and see if there are other subsonic servers that let you do that with your catalog but I'm not sure if I'm there yet. The thing is, for me to give her that kind of access, she first has to be able to read. <laughs> and she's not quite there yet. So it's not a massive panic if that's not possible right now. Mm -hmm. More on that later, I don't, don't doubt. Absolutely. Yeah, and while Mark's journey with Subsonic may be coming to a close, I'm still investigating. And while I saw Mark was investigating Android apps, I found Supersonic, which is a Linux desktop client for Subsonic and Subsonic implementations. So I'm hoping to be using that with my Subsonic server in the future. This episode is sponsored by Tailscale. Everyone these days has a VPN as a sponsor, but Tailscale isn't like those. This isn't about hiding your browsing habits from coffee shop owners, and it's not about watching Netflix in another country. Tailscale is a proper VPN for connecting your devices securely. It's great for companies, and it's great for self-hosters like me. Tailscale is the easiest way to connect devices and services to each other wherever they are. It's an intuitive, programmable way to manage a private network. Authenticate without authentication using Tailscale app connectors or send files securely from any node to any node on your Tailnet using Taildrop. 
Loads of the late night Linux family hosts use Tailscale for all sorts, including controlling 3D printers, remoting into relative systems for support, controlling Home Assistant, and setting ZFS snapshots to off-site backup locations. Tailscale's personal plan will always be free, so support the show and try Tailscale out for free today. You'll get up to 100 devices and 3 users for free, with no credit card required at tailscale.com slash linuxmatters. That's tailscale.com slash linuxmatters. Inspired by Mark's love of roguelike games, I'm coining the software category top-like. Oh dear. And I've got a definitive list of GPU top likes for you. Is this like top trumps, but with thumbs up? (laughs) No, this is tools that are like top, but more pretty and more better. So we've discussed a few of these in the past. Yes, like B top and bottom and B pi top and all those. Yeah. And Zenith and all the rest of them. Yeah, there's many of those. But these that I have for you today are specifically top likes for GPU metrics and statistics. Because I've typically got between two and three GPUs in my computers. And I like to use the GPUs for different things. And I like to see what they're doing and how they're being utilized. So I thought I'd give a rundown of the best that are available, because just like all the other top likes for things like CPU and RAM, there are many of the GPU top likes. And I thought I'd break it down into these are the only ones you need to care about. So without further ado, we'll start at the top with NVTOP, which I think most people may have encountered or heard about before. We've certainly spoken about it in the past. An NVTOP, originally for NVIDIA GPUs, hence the NV, is now a GPU and accelerator process monitoring application, but it works for AMD and Intel and NVIDIA, and also now Apple Silicon and Huawei and Qualcomm. So it's pretty comprehensive in the sort of GPU ecosystem that it can report and monitor on. So it's really sort of a go-to starter for everything because pretty much everything it runs on now to some extent. Is the Apple support very recent? Yes. (laughs) Okay. That'll be why when I run it on this here M1 with Apple Silicon, it says there are no GPUs to monitor. And if you have several GPUs, as in your setup, will it show you all of them, even if they're supported by different drivers or from different manufacturers? Yeah. So by default, if I run it on a multi-GPU system, let's say this workstation here, which has AMD and NVIDIA GPUs, by default, it will display them both. So you'll see a graph and a sort of a metrics overview for both GPUs stacked side by side. And in the process list, it shows all of the compute and graphics processes and the GPU ID that they are running on. But then it's an interactive tool. So you can filter that live or you can start NVTOP and say, just show me what's on this GPU or just show me the NVIDIA GPUs or whatever you want to do. So it's a great place to start, but it is all the GPUs. And it turns out that there are implementations of top likes that are specific to GPU architectures. And interestingly, you get a lot more functionality and features when you start digging into this. So the first one is Intel GPU top. <laughs> so, oh, what does that do? I know. <laughs> what could it do? So this is a top like specifically for Intel GPUs. It's from Intel. It's in the Intel GPU utilities, and it reports on performance metrics and power and memory bandwidth. And it's the only one of the top likes here that I haven't actually tested yet. And that's because I have a dwindling number of Intel-based systems with IGPs. So I will get to testing this on my server at some point, but I've listed it here for completeness because as far as I can tell, this is the only Intel specific top like tool. And because it's made by Intel, it supports just about everything and you can twiddle it and report on all of the different things that an Intel GPU can do. Is it pretty like NVTOP or ugly like PowerTOP? 
Somewhere in between. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the prettiest top like I've ever seen. It's got a UI only a mother could love, right? <laughs> <laughs> and as Intel are sort of now working their way into the discrete graphics market, I'm hopeful that maybe somebody will pick up the baton and they will make a beautiful top like for Intel at some point. We shall see. Next, I have NVI top, which is obviously very similar in name to NV top. NVI top is NVIDIA specific, and it's a bit like B top meets NVIDIA SMI. NVIDIA SMI is a first party tool from NVIDIA that tells you about running processes on your GPUs, how much RAM power and all of that that's going on. But it's a static utility and it uses ASCII in air quotes graphics to print on the screen. Yes, I remember using this when I was uh, testing my first Steam box and I was while I was playing on my telly I'd be SSH'd in to my Steam box from my laptop and running watch <laughs> Nvidia SMI to try and get some sort of live update of the metrics. Like any normal nerd, yeah. <laughs> right. So, no need to do that in 2024 because NVI top is that live view. And one of the command line options to NVI top is dash dash colourful. And you want to turn that on because it's colourful by default, but it's more colourful <laughs> if you give it the colourful <laughs> flag. So you get like gradients on the graphs Ooh, nice. and things like that. It's very pretty. So, Alan, to your earlier point, as top legs go, this is extremely pretty. So it has all of those pseudo braille graphics and charts and what have you. What I like about this is it's extremely detailed. And in particular, one very useful feature is when you're looking at compute processes, if you use NVIDIA SMI and you've got, say, a Python module that's running some sort of uh, compute task, in NVIDIA SMI, that will just show up as Python. But with NVI Top, it actually shows you the specific module that that process relates to so you can see specifically what's being executed at any point in time and how that's uh, loaded up on the gpu and this gets even better if you've got multiple nvidia gpus so let's imagine you're a supercomputer <laughs> and you want a visualization of what all your gpus are doing it really shines when you're looking at multiple gpus and all of those processes spread across those gpus and it has filters, live interactive filters to say, just show me the compute tasks or just show me the graphics processes. So you can really tune it down to exactly what you want to do. And it's implemented in Python. And as well as just being a utility, it is a module. So you can import MVI top into your Python application and you can create your own tooling using all of the features of MVI top which is extremely comprehensive. It's way better than Pi NVL, I think it was called, and all of the other little things I've seen in the past that are interrogate GPUs in Python. Really great. Some of you may have used NVIDIA HTOP in the past, and as is true of HTOP, HTOP has been superseded across the top-like ecosystem. NVI Top is way better than NVIDIA HTOP. I'm sorry, there's a top-like ecosystem now, is there? I'm inventing it right oh, now. Okay. I'm, oh, I've now. created the category. Got it. Got it. I own it. You I'm, it I'm going to register toplike.com after this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> so do you leave these running somewhere or only when you're doing something especially brutal? When I'm streaming... I keep one running so that I can make sure that the GPU is like, you know, comfortable in terms of temperature and power and there's nothing going over the top. That was more relevant when I was doing game streaming because like games plus streaming, it can get a bit interesting. So I have done that. But for general desktop stuff, no, not unless I'm doing something really intensive. What I'm mostly using tools like this for is as I experiment with machine learning tools to actually see how the processes are loaded up on the GPU and comparing. I've got different GPUs of different classes, and it's quite useful in like choosing a lower power GPU that can satisfy the task you want by sort of looking at some of these metrics and seeing how it's performing and if it's adequate for what you want to get done. And lastly, 
and unsurprisingly, we have AMD GPU Top, <laughs> which is, as you would expect, it's a bit like NVIDIA SMI, but interactive and for AMD. It's a little different in that it doesn't do the pseudographic graphs. It does bar graphs of all of the metrics. But again, this is extremely detailed. There is stuff in here I don't even know what it means. I've had to go and read about my GPU to actually understand what some of the capabilities it's reporting on. It's wonderful. It's the best AMD sort of informational monitoring tool I've encountered. And surprise, it is also a GUI app. So when you install it, you get a desktop entry and it has a full GUI app. And this is beautiful to behold. It is laden with graphs and metrics and pop-outs. And you can see absolutely everything. And in fact, if you fully expand all of the options, it won't fit on a 2560 by 2880 dual up monitor because it is so information dense. Gosh. So it's absolutely <laughs> wonderful. Can you monitor how much GPU it's using to draw that giant screen full of detail? <laughs> yeah, it's surprisingly efficient because it doesn't show up in the, yeah, in the top tier at doesn't. all. <laughs> <laughs> Who guards the guards? Yeah, It's very efficient. I think it's a GTK app or a Q app, but it's very pretty. So those are my top likes for GPU utilities. I absolutely love these tools. They're great for tinkering with really good when you're playing games and you want to monitor like changes you've made to your configuration and see if the power has improved or if the GPU is overburdened. Linux Matters is part of the Late Night Linux family. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting us and the rest of the Late Night Linux team using the PayPal or Patreon links at linuxmatters.sh slash support. For $5 a month on Patreon, you can enjoy an ad-free feed of our show, or for $10, get access to all the Late Night Linux shows ad-free. You can get in touch with us via email, show at linuxmatters.sh, or chat with other listeners in our Telegram group. All the details are at linuxmatters.sh slash contact. When I want to throw some code together, it's almost always a bunch of commands that I string together in a shell script using bash because I know what the commands are that I want to run. I know what they do. And I take the output of one and stick it in another and I put it in a loop and I might break it down into functions. And I, I generally use bash for that because I know it, it's easy. It's the, the easy option for me to reach for when I need to automate something or script something. However, I am trying to push myself away from doing that towards using Python instead. And I did that recently by creating a Mastodon bot called Uncle Clive. And Uncle Clive is named after the late, great Sir Clive Sinclair, the inventor of the Sinclair Spectrum and many other small computers and other technology. And the goal of Uncle Clive is to be similar to the BBC Micro bot in that you toot at it with some Sinclair basic, and it replies with a little video of what that would look like if it was run on a spectrum. Mm -hmm. Now, I actually started this a year ago and I kind of burned out or got frustrated or I don't know, lost interest. And then something piqued my interest again recently, which is Terence Eden posted on Mastodon that he's created an account that posts demo toots. So if you're developing an application, you can follow that account or try and render all the things that are in that account. It's got examples of a, a poll, a GIF, a video, and all the different types of toots that are possible in that account. And I engaged with that thread and I had a response. And it was that that made me think, oh yeah, I was going to do a bot, wasn't I? And then I dug out the code. I had to restore it from a backup somewhere because it was over a year ago. And I... I kind of hacked at it and eventually got it working to a point where anyone could just toot at, at Uncle Clive with 10 print quotes, hello, 20, go to 10, send the toot off. And then my little machinery at the other end would pick up that toot and then process it in such a way that 
it could then upload an MP4 video and send it back as a reply to the other person using the Mastodon API. Presumably this isn't actually like sending it to a Spectrum and running it and then like recording a telly that it's plugged into. Is this a, a Spectrum emulator? Is this something in Python that's pretending, that's just interpreting the Spectrum basic? What's actually going on in there? I love all your options there of uh, <laughs> like sending it to a human being who's sitting there typing. <laughs> Printing it in a magazine, so go and buy it from the news agent. <laughs> yes. Encoding it in Kansas City standard and putting it on a cassette tape. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I put it on the front of a magazine. No, none of those things. It is the latter. What it does is it looks for notifications, gathers the notifications, because that's because it's been added, you know, at sign my account, and then it extracts the text. And that text is sanitized a little bit, but not enough. It then turns that into a .tap file. So it converts it into a tape. Okay. Right? And then launches an emulator called Fuse. And Fuse is a popular Spectrum emulator that's cross-platform open source. And Fuse can load tape files. So your basic, your toot in... Um, sent to Uncle Clive is turned into a tape, loaded into the emulator, and Fuse has a built-in capability to create a video oh, nice. of whatever was on screen. And it writes that out in a strange format. It's its own internal, highly compressed format. Now, bearing in mind the resolution of the screen is only like 320 by 240, so it's not huge. I then have to encode it in such a way that it can be uploaded to, to Mastodon. And so I then use FFmpeg, and I turn that output from Fuse into something that I can then upload to Mastodon. And then it creates a reply using the Mastodon API. There's a mastodon.py that I'm using in Python to send the reply. And it just uploads the media and then creates a toot and sends the toot with the media attached. So was your choice of Python mostly for handling the Mastodon API or all of the emulator and video interaction? It was mostly for the API stuff because, you know, you can use most of these APIs with curl. You can just poke the endpoint with curl, but that got really frustrating in Bash and really cumbersome, especially with lots of string manipulation and having to extract things like the account name of the person and the toot ID and keep a track of the toot ID all the way through the code. And it just became a bit of a mess. In fact, I didn't even start in Bash. I think I wrote like three or four lines using curl. And I thought this is insanity. And I found a Python library. And that's been working pretty well. That's not the problem. The problem is the whole machinery around getting the emulator to do the right thing, because the emulator just runs forever. And it's actually quite hard to kill it with a kill minus nine or a p kill or any of the Python methods you would normally use to kill a process. You know, once it's finished doing what you want and you want to kill it off, it's actually quite hard in this particular case with this particular emulator. So I actually had to patch Fuse <laughs> and make it count to a certain number of frames and then flush the video, stop recording, flush the video out, and then exit gracefully. So I've patched Fuse which is written in C. I've got my own patched version <laughs> of Fuse doing this. And then I had to do a bit of funky stuff with FFmpeg as well in order to determine the point at which there is no more movement on the screen and there is no more audio on the screen because I don't want to upload one minute long video when there's only three seconds of action, shall we say. That's been the tricky bit, but that's not really Python. That's FFmpeg internals, and that's Fuse internals. The Python part was actually pretty straightforward, and I found it quite pleasant using Python. And I've learned a lot about Python, and I've learned a lot about the Mastodon API while doing this. Yeah, I, at work, if we have any, so most of our actual development is done in PHP and JavaScript because well, that's you know the systems we're developing on. But if we're doing sort of internal tooling, we tend to go with Python for that rather than doing bash scripts because yeah especially yeah like you say once you get to anything which is string manipulation or anything which requires an array i mean generally even command line arguments yes you can do them in bash but it's not pretty there's really nice ways of handling all that in python right it's absolutely the go-to tool i think for that and also the fact that you do have modules and apis for everything if something has an api they have a python module for it right yeah, on that point, I was going to ask, like the FFmpeg stuff, are you manipulating FFmpeg by like calling FFmpeg or are you using a Python module to abstract that, Pythonize it? 
So those tools like Fuse and FFmpeg, and there's also another convert utility I have to use to get it out of the format that Fuse creates and into something FFmpeg can use. So there's three command, no, four command line utilities. There's also the tool that converts the plain text basic into a tap file. Those are four separate command line utilities. They're all in the archive and I can run them from the command line using subprocess.popen or whatever in, in Python. And that's okay. That has been a bit tricky because capturing the output from them and making sure they run correctly and the way you have to do it as like a list of comma separated quoted strings is, is a bit frustrating. And there are ways around that. I know that which I've learned only in the last like week or so, but it has been a challenge, but it's been a challenge where I've had a goal to get to, which is someone can toot at this thing and it replies with a video and it has worked. There have been bugs and, you know, I've tried to implement some improvements and some of them have gone well and some of them not. And part of that is because I'm editing the code directly live, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, because I don't have a test account I have one Uncle Clive account and people do at that and it processes them. I would like to build a, a like a test harness locally that it can go through a bunch of basic programs and then produce the videos and show whether they worked or not. But at the moment, it's just like hacking directly live on production. So you said they're tooting at Uncle Clive. This is the whole point. If I was to toot a basic program at Uncle Clive, how long before I should expect a reply with a video attached? That's a very good question. And I've worked a little bit to try and optimize it and I, it still needs more optimization. But in general, it currently polls. It would be better if it used the Mastodon streaming API and that's on my to-do list, but it polls the account getting notifications. And if there's nobody else ahead of you in the queue, you're next. It takes no time at all to convert that into a tap file. It then runs real time, the emulator, and so it's going to run for a minute to run the emulator. Then it's going to take no time at all to convert that into an AVI file. And then it has to convert it into an MP4. Don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> and then it has to create a screen, a thumbnail screenshot to be uploaded to Mastodon as well. So there's a thumbnail and then it uploads it to Mastodon. So you're looking a few minutes is okay. I've tried running it faster but there are some timing issues around that, but it could be made faster. So when you say it runs real time, does that tape loading process run like a tape loading process <laughs> I would remember from the 80s? Thankfully not. The tape loading <laughs> process is instant okay, and it automatically runs the basic program as well. So it, right. it loads and runs instantly. That takes no time at all. But then the bit that takes the time is actually running your program. I've tried accelerating it and it's harder than you think. There's a bit of maths involved there to get the number of frames right. And some of the ROM utilities, I'm not sure they work perfectly when accelerated at like 500%. But it is, <laughs> it is possible to do. And I have got special builds of views that can run you know, full <laughs> tilt while also recording the screen for a period of time. So it's been a fun and interesting thing. I'm going to put the code on GitHub. I haven't yet because I'm a little bit scared that everyone will laugh at me. You remember my previous joy of code where I don't share anything until I'm happy with it. Well, I'm not quite happy with it yet, but I have been using the tools it built into the code editor. I've been using VS Code and using PyLint, the linter thing, and it's been giving me suggestions on how to fix things like variable names and the way functions are written and all that kind of stuff. And so I, all the way I'm learning, so it's enjoyable. And my goal is... For the next thing, I'm going to try not to reach for Bash first, but reach for Python first and try and use Python if it's appropriate, rather than using Bash to try and increase that learning. Because I think the information falls out of my head if I don't use it on a regular basis. And that's what I need to do. 